is the final day of what has been a really glorious conference with some <coughs> thought-provoking <coughs> papers, and I'm sure that we have another three for everybody this morning. So if you are not in 6A conduct, and you really want to be in another session, this would be a time to get up and exit with only a smidgen of your honor uh, staying behind. Um, our first speaker actually is here at the University of Southampton, but he has completed his PhD at Hull, and he has worked on project dealing with the Tudor <coughs> merchant fleet, but he is sort of, as he said, moonlighting again, back to one of his previous military history interests. And today, Dr. Gary Baker is going to regale us with stories of to Agincourt and beyond the martial affinity of Edward <coughs> Duke of York, or actually Edward of Langley, Duke of York. So, thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Um, well, at the start of the talk, I'm probably going to cover some old ground, so you'll excuse me before I get on to the, the meat of the talk. Um, well, as we all know, the, the Battle of Agincourt, which was fought on 25th October 1415, is probably only rivaled by the Battle of Hastings in the English national consciousness. It is certainly one of the most studied battles in English history, and of course, the 600 anniversary has obviously brought us all together today for this wonderful conference we've, we've had, I'm sure I'll agree we've all enjoyed. Now... Oh, there we go. Now, as again, as many of you have already mentioned, and another plug for it, um, the completion in 2009 of the Soldier in Later Medieval England project has revolutionised the study of late 14th and early 15th century armies. Now, with only a few clicks of a button, we were able to access the names of tens of thousands of men who fought for the English crown from 1369 to 1453. <coughs> now, for historians, particularly um, historians who look at this period in military history generally, it has made the reconstruction of at least a portion, and I stress only a portion, but a large portion, of the careers of thousands of fighting men, a much more manageable task than it was, say, 10 to 15 years ago. Now, the biggest problem with uh, medieval military records, as I'm sure many of you are no doubt aware, is that they rarely provide a geographic fix, especially in the later half, from the later half of the 14th century, particularly onwards, um, for any of the men, or many of the men who fought in, the, in many of the retinues of the period. And this is just one of the example of many I've chosen to show. It's uh, from the <coughs> Earl of Stafford's uh, campaign. I think it's France, actually, it probably should be Ireland, actually, but never mind, nevertheless, um, in 1362. Um, now, even ancillary documents like letters of protection and attorney and charters of pardon, though sometimes, do not always provide geographic information. <clears throat> it is thus always a leap of faith to link two men of the same name in different records together and class this as one individual, what we call nominal record linkage. But despite such problems, uh, if we are careful, and sometimes take a little bit of a leap of faith on occasion, uh, the attempt to, uh, attempt to reconstruct the military careers of medieval soldiers is well worth the effort for what it can tell us about recruitment networks of the period. I'd like, therefore, to make the focus of today's presentation the military careers, both pr uh, before and after 1415, of the members of the retinue of Edward, Duke of York, who took part in Henry V's great triumph at Agincourt. So why Edward? I've actually no idea whether Edward looks like this, actually. He's, um, <coughs> this is from, a, this is from a, a website where they paint these miniatures, so I thought it was quite nice, so I've put it on the board for you there. No idea if it looked like that. Maybe, I mean, one of the facts he actually died, maybe because he didn't put his helmet on, I don't know. But anyway. Um, <coughs> so, of all the retinues then, why have I chosen to look at Edward? Well, the first of all is York's social status. As the son of Edmund of Langley, the first Duke of York, and thus a grandson of Edward III, Edward, Duke of York, was one of the leading aristocrats in England in 1415, with a retinue of commensurate size to represent this rank. <coughs> he brought with him on the campaign, or he indented with the crown, um, to bring 400 men. Now, one of the king's brothers, the Dukes of Clarence, with 960 men, and Gloucester, with 800 men, agreed to serve Henry V with more men on the expedition. There were a couple of other earls... 
um, who also had similar sized retinues, but ultimately, you know, these are the, the premier retinue commanders in 1415. Now, the second reason is that Edward is tainted in the mind of many of his contemporaries with treason. Now, prior to the Agincourt campaign, his brother, Richard, Earl of Cambridge, as I'm sure many of you know, had been beheaded as one of the conspirators in the Southampton plot just prior to the campaign setting off to France. Now, the, <coughs> though York played no part in the plot, as far as we are aware, um, he was thought of as, as untrustworthy by a number of his contemporaries. Um, having, and he was one of the reasons for this, he was previously very close to the previous King Richard II, and um, there's kind of uh, there's, there's thoughts that he may have turned well, he turned tail on Richard II basically. Um, and it, at one stage in the sort of the 1390s, the doctors had to describe him as Richard's brother, um, which shows the sort of the closest between the two men. So he's actually seen as a bit of a turncoat. Um, <laughs> He also was flirted with treason, if you like, during the reign of Henry IV. He was briefly imprisoned um, temporarily uh, for his part in a, in a plot, but it was eventually forgiven. But nevertheless, his steady stream of appointments and military service under the first two Lancastrian <coughs> kings, and the fact that the Duke commanded the vanguard and the English right at Agincourt, again, as far as we're aware, who knows, um, a, which is a, a position of particularly high honour, and it is clear, then, that at least Henry V trusted him. Now, <clears throat> the third reason is, um, is that he have earned the dubious distinction of being the highest-ranking English casualty at Agincourt. I think, I believe the Earl of Suffolk as well also died, but in terms of... Um, but York was definitely the highest-ranking casualty that we know of. Now, his death on the battlefield, however, means we're able to ask a fundamental question of his retinue. How did the Duke's death affect the posthumous dispersal of his men? Or, more simply, in what capacity did they go on to serve after his death? <clears throat> now, whilst recent research and some of that we've heard in the, of during the course of this conference has shown that typically in this period men move from one retinue to another over the course of their military careers, the core of a captain's retinue generally stayed together from campaign to campaign. It's not particularly... I mean, it's, I won't go into it now, but basically the, the core of the retinue maintain, of a 10, 20 men, generally, depending on the size of the, the captain's affinity, generally, generally stick with the captain. But of course, <clears throat> in 1415, York's men have a problem because their captain's actually killed. And <clears throat> now ordinarily you would have, what sometimes <clears throat> happened was that the men would then just move on to the, move on to, uh, en masse, in, as it were, to the, like, the next Duke of York. But unfortunately... Um, for the York, well, I'll call them Yorkists, it's probably a little bit. But anyway, point for the Yorkist retinue personnel, um, the next Duke of York was um, the, Richard, the third Duke of York, was actually only a boy at this time, the son of the, the former um, Earl of Cambridge who was beheaded. So there was no immediate retinue within, with which with these men could easily turn. <clears throat> In other words, all of York's men after Agincourt had to find an alternative affinity if they wanted to continue their martial careers. Now, there are four questions I want to try to answer for you today. First of all, where did men, York's men come from? And what I mean by that is where did they come from geographically? <clears throat> How many men had served York prior to 1415? Give me. Uh, and, and often, and thus, we can, we, could, we can argue from the core of his Agincourt retinue, uh, where, with and under whom did the survivors of the 14 camp 14, 15 campaign go on to serve? And finally, how many men, if any, remained loyal to York's family who, and found their way in later life into the affinity of the aforementioned Richard, 3rd Duke of York? <clears throat> now, before I can answer these questions, we must examine the 14 15 retinue in more detail. <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, the Duke agreed with Henry V and his indenture, excuse me, prior to the campaign, dated the 29th of April 1415, to provide 400 men for the expedition, 100 men at arms and 300 <laughs> archers. The men at arms had been broken down as one baron, four knights, and 95 esquires. Now, who were these men? Now, York's retinue is also unique amongst the 1415 retinues, is that there is actually two surviving muster rolls for, the, um, for his retinue. Uh, the first one was uh, both were undated, but we can roughly guess from when they were when they were drawn up. 
Um, the first one relates to the first quarterly period of service. The campaign campaigning periods when this period generally defined broken up into quarterly periods of service over a, a twelve month period. Um, so this is um, <coughs> excuse me. Now this is the first document you can see on the screen was lightly compiled on about the 8th of July, which is the date the, tu the Duke's troops were mustered at Southampton. And it can be roughly divided into two distinctive sections. The first contains lists of men at arms, and here described with lancers, uh, and mounted archers, and they're bracketed together, as you can see in the photograph. So here we've got like Stephen Popham, and then three archers underneath <coughs> him. Um, <coughs> now these groupings ranging from about three to 25 men likely represent the sub-companies which made up the retinue. And there are about 46 of these in all. Now the clerk compiling the roll gives the cumulative totals of these companies as one duke, obviously York, one lord, or banneret, three knights, and 95 men-at-arms and 250 archers, or more simply, 100 men-at-arms <coughs> and 250 archers. Now the second section of the, the, second section of the roll uh, and I'm translating here, is uh, the names of the valets of the household of a said duke. And it consists of 80, the names of 85 men, some of whom were described as archers, followed by two entries denoting 16 unnamed individuals and I think four bargemen and 12 dikers, which are basically non components In the left hand margin in this section, I've not got a photo of it for you here, unfortunately, but um, some of, the, some of the men, as I say, appear as archers, and actually some of the men have crosses next to the names. <coughs> and it's likely, but not certain, that those of a cross next to the name are actually not receiving crown wages during this quarter. So in all, therefore, the Duke had about 450 men with him, or the, the memory indented for 400, 450 men at the beginning of the first quarter, although, as I say, only 400 of these were in receipt of pay. Now, <coughs> the reason I can't be exact about the number of men present in the first quarter is because of the state of the role this first quarter. There you can see it. Um, <clears throat> the first member on your, your left-hand side, that's... The, the, now, fortunately, after the first member, it gets better. But unfortunately, as you can see, and I've used the UV light then, got in quite close, you can't, you can't <coughs> actually make much out from that first quarter of the roll. And so then, I, so thus, I can't be exactly precise about the number of companies and uh, the, the exact number of men. I'm just going on with the, the totals provided by the clerk. Um, and as I say, it's very fortunate, therefore, that the second muster roll for York's uh, campaign, uh, York's retinue, exists. There we are. Now, the second roll was in all likelihood, and again, it's not dated, but it was drawn up shortly after the siege of Half Fleur, which fell on the 22nd of September. For, for a number of the men, as you can see here, are denoted as being absent from York's retinue. Some have been placed with the garrison. <coughs> Now, the road is a quite a complicated document. I don't want to go into too much detail here. And the numbers it provides of those who were sick had died, and as I say, in some cases, been placed in the, the <coughs> half of the garrison, do not tally up exactly with the post-campaign accounts of the retinue, which was, which was submitted to the Exchequer after the campaign. And as I say, I don't want to get too bored down in detail, but suffice it to say that any, any um, losses in the, <coughs> the retinue we'd suffered appear to have been replaced either by reinforcements from England or were drawn from other armies, um, other retinues in the army. There's, there's a considerable amount of reorganisation went on uh, after the siege of Half Flow just because of the, the, the sheer number of men that had um, either died or been sent home through sickness. Now, in all, then, taking both musters together, a total of 477 men are named in York's affinity. 112 only served in the first quarter, 20, and we assume these are the ones that were, were sick for whatever reason, uh, 28 served only on the second quarter, and 337 were in arms for the Duke for the entirety of the campaign. Um, and we, we have to assume up to the Battle of Agincourt. <coughs> now, even taking the likely non combatants into consideration, it seems that when the retinue took the field at Agincourt, therefore, its fighting strength, despite the depredations of the campaign to date, numbered between about 380 and 400 men, or roughly the same number as the Duke had agreed to serve with prior to the campaign. Now, at the battle itself, as well as the Duke, the retinue did suffer severe casualties. We've had things about discussions before about whether or not... Um, who, why, why, despite all these campaigns, very few men ever seem to die. Well, on this occasion, we've got good evidence for it. Now, I don't know if you can see it. It's a very, it's a very poor photograph, unfortunately. But we know from a post-campaign account that the King, after the campaign, for Yorkshire retinue, paid to transport one baron, three knights 
and a combination of 279 esquires and archers and 329 horses back, back to Dover and Sandwich. In other words, if we are correct in our assertion that there's about 380 to 400 men in the Duke's retinue at Agincourt, then the residue somewhere, suffered somewhere in the region of a quarter to a third of its fighting strength. Unfortunately, there is no surviving nominal post-campaign account listing uh, the men that survived the battle for Yorkshire and so we cannot be sure the identities of these men, unfortunately. But barring such ambiguities, let's turn to our questions for, for the day. <clears throat> Number one, from where did the, the men who fought in Yorkshire and you originate? Now, I should state that the figures I'm presenting here today are related primarily to the men-at-arms, unless otherwise stated, because <coughs> these are the men who are actually easiest to track in both national and local records. Now, we can infer from toponymic, I hope I've said that right, um, evidence, the, which is basically looking at names and surnames, the origin of at least some of the individuals. For example, at least 17 archers and three men-at-arms were of Welsh origin, given their names, such as, and apologies any Welsh being known as, Jimmy Ap David and Rhys Ap Pipe. There are also a handful of archers who are explicitly stated as being of a certain town. One of York's household archers, um, such as John of Fod Foddingen Hare, which is probably Fothering Hare in Northamptonshire, and the archers Thomas and Richard of Oaks, probably from Oakham in Rutland. But to ascertain more detailed geographic information about the, a larger number of men in the retinue, we are forced to turn to other sources. <clears throat> now, medieval martial materials, as I mentioned earlier, are little help in this respect. Only two of the seven letters of protection which were issued for York's retinue for the campaign provide geographic information about the recipient, <coughs> Robert Brown and Sir Thomas Burton, both of whom were from Rutland. The best way to ascertain the geographic origins of men is to go beyond the martial records into the non, into sort of non-military national and local records, as I've said before. Now, occasionally, information does come from a chance finding the role, such as the case of the Esquire William Trussell Jr. of Eastern Maud at Northamptonshire, who is mentioned in an inquisition before the justice of that county as committing various felonies in the area with fellow miscreants, including the yeoman Richard Taylor, and actually a man of the same name served as an archer in Trussell's sub-company in 1415, so we can, we can never be sure, but we can be reasonably certain that these are the same men. Now, nevertheless, it has been possible, despite such difficulties of nominal record linkage, to ascertain the geographic origins, or at least the region from which they came, of over half of York's men at arms. And we can see there, 54 out of 100, not including the Duke himself. Of these 54 men, the origin of 18 can be stated with a certainty, with the rest ranging from a reasonably high degree of confidence to a few with common names, of which there are several possibilities. <coughs> now, just over a third of these 54 men, 23, came from the Midland counties, with the biggest contributions coming from the contiguous counties of Leicestershire, Northamptonshire and Rutland, with five, five and four men, respectively. The next biggest regional contributor to, to the retinue was the south of England, with 20 men, with the biggest county contributor in the south, funnily enough, being Hampshire, with six men coming from the area. The northern counties, for the Duke of York, uh, made a relatively light contribution, with Yorkshire contributing four and Cumberland one. The rest are scattered about Wales, Lincolnshire and East Anglia. Now, such a geographic distribution does actually make sense, considering that York's primary land holdings centred in the Midlands, principally seat at Fotheringhay, uh, Castle in Northamptonshire, <coughs> whilst the Inquisition post-mortem undertaken after his death and that of his wife, Philippa Bohun, or Bohun, reveals a wide-ranging spread of territorial interest broadly represented by the findings of this investigation. Unfortunately, though, the random distribution of men of known geographic provenance throughout the, sub throughout the retinue makes it difficult to say anything concrete about where individual sub-retinue companies originated. It would be tempting, for example, to make the assumption that the company headed by Sir Thomas Burton of Tolthorpe, Northamptonshire, a Robert Burton, presumably a relative, and Thomas Darby, who may be the same man who served as a Leicestershire MP in 1401, were an entirely Midlands company, but as we have no geographic information for the three remaining men at arms and 14 archers in this company, we cannot be sure for definite. Moving on now to our second question. How many men fought for York prior to 1415? In particular, how many men had fought under his banner before within his own retinue, likely forming the core around which this retinue was built? Again, despite the rare survival of an account book for York's household from October 1409 to June 1410, there's little novel information contained within. Now, what is more unfortunate <clears throat> 
is that despite the Duke's career in arms and royal service that stretched back at least two decades prior to 1415, there does not appear to be any extant nominal documentation where it gives a complete picture of any of his previous retinues, although we can ascertain how many men served under his banner on a number of occasions, such as on Richard II's <laughs> Irish expedition in 1394-95, where as Earl of Rutland, he was accompanied by 10 knights, 40 men at arms and 150 archers. But again, we're, on, we're in... Com- nearly entirely in the dark as to who these men actually were. Our only real nominal date of these expeditions, as far as York's men are concerned, comes from the enrolled letters of protection and attorney. And again, un- a lot of unfortunate was here, but unfortunately for our study of the 1415 retinue, of the 91 letters of protection and attorney issued to York's retinues prior to 1415, only three men in receipt of these documents appear in the Agincourt retinue although several men who share surnames with Agincourt retinue members do appear, suggesting, perhaps, fathers serving the Duke in the 1390s with sons 15 to 20 years later. Now, this lack of previous muster material, as I've said, makes ascertaining who formed the Duke's inner circle at Agincourt a difficult task, but we are not wholly in the dark. (coughs) At least ten of the men in the men-at-arms in the 1415 retinue were tenorial and likely strong personal connections to York, and some of these... Um, and others were in receipt of um, annuities from the Duke. Two of the most prominent were John Popham, a cousin of another of the retinue's men at arms, Stephen Popham, both of whom incidentally may have been knighted on or shortly after the campaign, and Thomas Beauchamp, both of whom were mentioned in York's <coughs> will. Popham was bequeathed goods, including fabrics of red velvet, a bassinet, and the Duke's best horse, whilst Beauchamp also received fabrics and ten marks. Rivaling these men in provenance was Sir Thomas Burton of Tolthorpe in Rutland, a near neighbour of York at Fotheringhay, who was granted the hundred of Little Casterton by the Duke on the 31st of January 1415, and in all had grants amounting to 200 marks a year. Indeed, both Burton and Popham, along with the third first 1415 man at arms, William Wolverston, were noted as still being alive on the 12th of May 1432 and in receipt of annuities from the Ducal Estates when Edward's nephew, Richard, the third Duke, received livelihood of his uncle's lands. Several other members of York's retinue can also be shown to have had personal connections to the Duke, although one further example will suffice. And the document you can actually see on the screen here shows the granting of a coat of arms by the Duke to one of his men of arms, John Bruggerford, um, whilst both men were at the Siege of half on the 29th of August. I haven't got a detailed shot. But <clears throat> and this was an important gesture which technically raised Bruggerford into the, Armid- you know, the ranks of the Armidras classes, if you like. Now, we're also able to ascertain links, or at least previous shared martial service connections amongst York's 1415 retinue personnel. Even if we cannot ascertain whether they fought for the Duke on previous occasions, we can certainly determine for whom they did fight. <clears throat> of York's 100 men at arms, being the third and a half can be shown to have had military careers prior to 1415, some perhaps as far back as 1369, with at least some within the same retinues as their future Agincourt brothers at arms. There is insufficient space and time here to elucidate all of this service, and the most pertinent examples must suffice. The most obvious link between York's men at arms in previous service comes in from 1404, when eight men served in the Welsh garrisons of Carmarthen and Newcastle Emlyn. Indeed, Sir Thomas Burton led the garrisons of Cardigan and Lamp and I'm terrible for numbers here, Lampadervour in 1404-5, with all told 19 men at arms, including himself and 51 archers. Of this company, his fellow man at arms and presumably relation Robert Burton and possibly one of the mounted archers, John Chamberlain, went on to serve in the same sub company in 1415. Now, moving on to our third question. Where, with and under whom did the, the survivors of York's retinue go on to serve? Now, fortunately, uh, the martial records from 1417 to the end of the Hundred Years' War in 1453 make it possible to say that, again, about half of York's men at arms continued their martial careers post-1415. Whether or not those who, were, those who we cannot find records for did not serve because they had tired of military service or, in fact, were, had been killed in 1415, again, we can't know because we don't have a nominal list of York's retinue after the battle. <clears throat> Now, a large number of York's former men-at-arms are found serving on Henry V's next great expedition of 1417. Stephen Popham, now a knight, served with, served with Gloucester's retinue, as did Thomas Payne, Thomas Darby, Thomas Hatton, and the aforementioned John Bruggerford, enlisted under Richard Beauchamp, Lord Agbergaveni, or Bergaveni. William Lord Lovell, the banneret on York's 1415 expedition, 
served as a retinue captain in his own right in 1417 with six men at arms, including himself and 18 archers. He was also involved in the relief of Harfleur the same year and again acted as an independent captain in 1421, although none of these men at arms listed under his banner on any of these occasions appear to be those who fought in 1415. It'd be wrong to assume that the large number of men who served in 1417 from York's 1415 retinue, who by and large did not fight in the same retinues as their former comrades, is an indication of weak bonds between the men in 1415. An army was an organic body with many interweaving personal networks within it. The fact that large numbers of York's men were in the army, and doubts it to other Agincourt veterans, as we heard previously, will, be, will have aided its cohesion and dynamic stability in the field. Obviously, as the years pass, the likelihood of finding York's Agincourt veterans diminishes. Death from natural causes or combat, retirement due to old age, ill health, or a desire to pursue less dangerous careers in local administration were all certainly factors. We are able to be able to find, to be able to find a number of men, and I'm just going to give a couple of examples, so I realise I'm running out of time. Uh, Robert Burton and John Andrew were with William, Sir William Carew in the Earl of Devon Seaborn Venture in 1420, for example. Alexander Leeds served with Lords Fitzhugh in 1418, as he had the previous year, funnily enough. And uh, William Wolverstone is listed as being in the retinue of Thomas Wake on John Beaufort, Duke of Somerset's ineffective campaign in 1443. Now, that's I say, because I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to briefly move on to the final question. How many of, Edward's, how many of Edward of York's 1415 retinue went on to serve the affinity of his nephew, Richard, the third Duke? Now, the answer is obviously only a handful, as Richard only came of age and received live of his lands in, thir- in 1432. Those who did renew their Yorkist service did so either directly under the new Duke or by proxy with his associates. For example, John Newton and John Wilson served with members of the Mulso family in the late 1430s and 40s, a family from Northamptonshire who had long association with the Yorkists. Thomas Payne, amongst periods of service of several captains, found himself under the command of Richard during his time in the gar- his garrison at the, the Bridge of Rouen in the mid-1430s. Three other men, John Browning, Thomas Burton of Hampshire and John Stafford, appear in the garrison of Essay, Lower Normandy, during the 1420s and 30s. Now, <clears throat> if men at arms like Thomas Payne, who served in the garrison at Rouen in 1437, and William Burton, who were with Richard of York on his French expedition in 1441, were the same men who fought in the Yorkist retinue of Agincourt in 1415, then these old veteran greybeards are sure to have proved useful sources of counsel for the young Richard as he set out on his own tumultuous political and martial career. Thank you.